So on today's episode of Every Dog Gets His Day, I'm going to show you what a good day for me looks like. Like a really good day. So you guys know that when I buy stuff, I generally buy it in bulk. I keep the stuff that I want and I either sell the rest in another bulk again or I dispose of the stuff that I just don't think is worth my time trying to sell. It's very rare that I get to pick through a whole collection of things and pay what is a flat dollar amount per item, even for the cream. So today when I went to my local thrift store, I don't normally go thrifting, but I picked up what is like six kilos of die cast. And it's like, and it's good stuff. We're talking, you know, stuff like this that sells for anywhere from 40 to 70, depending on how long I'm willing to wait and whether I'm shipping overseas or not. All a dollar a piece. Cars like that, dollar a piece, that go for about 10 bucks because they're no longer made. This one was from 1984. You need things like this, even at a dollar, they go if they sell for five bucks, it's still something that moves stuff in my store. And when I create stores, I intend for stuff to move in bundles, anyways. So I'm not afraid of stuff that goes for five bucks. It's sure I make less money if I sell only the one item, but these items tend to go in bundles of three to ten, usually, anyways. So they drive traffic, stuff like that. The best thing about old toys is that it's heavy. I've mentioned this many, many times. It's heavy and it's got hydraulics. It, it's got, you know, it holds the weight. Look at that. Like the hydraulic bits are still intact. Stickers, you know, nowadays with the newer toys, things get printed on and they get scratched off. Pre in, in, you know, back in like the 70s and 80s, these toys used to have actual stickers. So if the stickers are still on there, it tells you this stuff has ne hasn't hasn't really been played with, it's probably just been displayed. And um, if my guess would be someone passed away, whoever this was left to didn't know what to do with it and just decided too hard, don't know anything about it, never cared for it, never cared for it when family member was alive, someone else can figure it out and they just left it at the thrift store. So I went in, I was picking through toy basket, the one of the ladies noticed I was really keen, said, hey, we've got another box up the back, do you want to have a look? Sure. She went up the back and then disappeared for a bit. I went and we, I went and like tried to look for her and the manager went, oh, I, I actually, she did ask me and then I sent her to do something else. I'm so sorry, we're really scatterbrained behind you. And I went, ha, ah, no problem. She brings out one bag, I sift through it. And then she goes, I think I saw another one. I think I saw another one. I went through three tubs. And so I thought I'd show it to you because I don't do this often on the channel. Not because I don't want to, but because everything I sell is pretty much the same. So it's kind of boring to do these show and tell things with you guys because I don't think I don't thrift generally. I wish I thrifted more generally. That way, you know, one day you'll see shoes, one day you'll see toys, one day you'll see, you know, clothes, electronics. But for the most part, he's gonna see toys. So this whole video really is about showing you what kind of day makes me feel really excited. Um like little, even things like that. These transporters go for around 20 bucks, 30 bucks. This one barely has a dent on it, as you can see. And um, these cars can pop off because they're just secured by plastic. So usually when I find these, the cars are missing on the top or there's a whole bunch of like dirt and gunk kind of caught in the crevices. But this one, look at that. The cream looks as clean as like a, as a white chocolate bar. So that makes me happy. Um, most, like you see, like most of the, the paint's already peeled off. But with these cars, the a lot of the collectors will just repaint them anyways or try and put new new decal stickers on them. So they still can sell, even though there are scratches on the paint, on the print. As long as the main body paint is still in good condition, the, the items still sell. Plastic, on the other hand, if there's like yellowing on the plastic, it doesn't go. But these ones, as you can tell, these were from, from memory, I think... 80s? No, 1978. See? The plastic is still fairly white. And we have another one. Look at that. The funny story, these these two transporters came from these came from two different tubs. So this op shop literally had two tubs of similar collections sitting in the back. They did not look like they were from the same house because the rest of the contents were kind of mixed and jumbled. And when when I looked, I was like, it just it just felt like coincidence. And so when I think about thrifting, and I think about thrifting as a as a way to source consistently, I I'm still not 
like this doesn't make me double down on thrifting at all. This just I only started thrifting again because um somebody was like, Oh, I wonder if you know you 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 could still thrift and if you if you'll still get any sort of result. And back in the day when I used to thrift, I didn't like I got stuff, but it wasn't like this kind of stuff. And it does make me wonder whether you know if you if you if you step away from thrifting for a while and then you come and, and you're still able to develop your stores by sourcing items in other areas whether when you come back it's like a opening of the eyes kind of kind of a situation i wonder if that's the case with me because i was not i kind of went back expecting it to be like a ha 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 give it a try all right let's go back to just doing things for normal and really i started thrifting again purely for the content because this is where the variety is right and um, I'm noticing a few things. I'm noticing a few things about what I'm seeing. I'm definitely noticing... I'm just definitely reawakening my ability to to find things hidden. Like, um, I went... To, like, the, the, the post with the comic books from, I think, three weeks ago, two weeks ago. Like, I go into the thrift store. I go to the kids section looking for toys, as I do. I look to my... And it was one of those thrift stores where you go in, there's a massive, it's like a massive kind of corridor type thrift store. And then on the, and then it kind of branches off. So essentially, the layout of the store is like a giant letter T. And so at the T part, the kids are in one corner and then there's like books and stuff in the other corner. But at the kids section, there's a bookshelf. Problem is the bookshelf is the same height, it's like a grown-up bookshelf. So at the, at the top, there are books facing out and these comics were sitting like that. So... If you think of it, books are usually like this. These were like that, but this way. So therefore, the spines were facing the books that were stacked. And it's just it's just like a stack of paper at my eye level, which means no kid would have seen it. So it's in the kid section. Only a grown-up would have seen it in the kid section. So hence, those books were a dollar. They were one thing, a dollar per book. The books usually go for four to five dollars anyways. And then in, in, in the end, all 23 books, they just went five dollars for all 23 because they just couldn't move it. No no surprise because it was in a position where nobody would have seen it and so i'm noticing a lot of these little quirks and with in today's one there were a couple of cars that were in a bag that were underneath clothing and by that i mean not like under a stack of clothing just the shelving that's really high for all the big stuff that's, that's pretty standard like you know you'll see all your carnival like soft toys your giant teddy bears on the top and then you'll have a couple of racks where kids can reach and they'll, they'll play, chuck it on the floor, a couple of baskets on the floor. But then there were these clothing racks where they are about my waist height. So essentially kids can reach for the clothing that kind of get kind of high. And underneath that were shelves that were usually, I suppose, meant for shoes. Except there were no shoes there, just these bags of toys. So if you're standing as a grown-up looking down, you can't see them. Kids will look at them, but kids know not to open these bags. So really, who are the bags for? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like no one really, no, someone just kind of thought there's space, I'm going to chuck stuff there. When in reality, when we think about how we position items for people to get them, uh, bagged means grown up, because kids are told not to open these bags. And if a grown up can't see them standing up, why are they there? And so I, I've just realized, I'm just remembering, I guess, the different ways you hunt for things in a, in a shop, because we were so used to going to stores expecting everything to be properly displayed. People complain about the pricing in op shops, um, because of a lack of knowledge. Another thing to capitalize on, apart from the pricing, that can be all over the place, is positioning. Not everyone in an op shop, not op shops are not trained to position things for you to buy the way a grocery store you know, puts the chocolate bars here, the mints here, the newspapers here, puts the milk at the back so that you walk through the store to get to the milk and you see everything else on the way. Like op shops don't do that. They just do what's pretty. That's what I, I feel. Every time I see a revamped op shop, I just think they've made this place brighter and prettier, but they haven't actually made it any more likely for me to buy something. I still need to go hunt. Just an observation. Things that I'm remembering um, as I as I go through this exercise. Uh, anyways, this is a good day. Um, I came I came back and I and I just wanted to and I and Jenny was like I want to go to bed and I went wait 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 wait, wait. I, want, I want to share this with you I want to I want to show you my good day <laughs> so in short just looking at this here a dollar a dollar a dollar a dollar a dollar a dollar so one two three four five six seven eight nine and ten right each one of these things goes for like though these ones go for about forty these go for anywhere from this one probably about forty as well that's about forty twenty twenty. This goes for 15 to 20, depending on how long I'm willing to wait for. 
Um, this one's missing the rope, but you can still put another rope on it. So the hydraulic is still in pretty good nick. See? Oh, so satisfying. Like, pushing metal on metal and not feeling any rust on the inside is like... It's like it's a good feeling. It's like pumping a new pump. Um, not even loose, which means that there's no crack in the plastic. This thing is meant to have something on top. I haven't researched it yet, but it looks pretty... More, more or less something like something someone would buy... Um, for the accessory that they have that normally goes on it. What were we? 10 bucks here? Let's say, let's go 30, 40, 20. So that's about 100 bucks there. Another 100, $200. That's a good day for me. This does not happen all the time. And I think the reason why I wanted to do this video is because for content creators who pump out Here's why I found videos. You need to understand, good good days like that don't happen all the time. For most of us, we are buying stuff at, you know, we'll, we'll pay, most of us generally pay like $2 and sell for 10. That's kind of the margins we look at for bread and butter stuff. This $1 to $1 to 20 kind of thing, that kind of ratio isn't every day. If it was every day, that person is super amazing and they would not be spending time making content. You have to understand that. I don't have any issue with content creators. I don't have any issue with people going to flea markets, going to you know clearance outlets to find really good deals, going to bins. The point being is if someone can find dollar to twenty, dollar to thirty, fifty every single day, or at least if that's the if the impression that you get from these videos is reality, they would not make videos. If I can find that every single day, I would not make videos. I will be like, there's no way I can make enough content on YouTube that would justify the money I make so that I do that instead of buy this. So this is a good day. This happens once every week, two weeks. More likely two weeks than a week. These wheels look like they match this. Ooh! There you go. Damn. Still got the stand. I want to... I really want to comp this one because I don't even know... The, I don't actually know the brand of it. But it's heavy and it's made in Singapore. Usually with um, usually with diecast stuff, we want made in Japan, we want made in China. We don't really think much about made in Singapore, which is and this one. It looks like the inside doesn't connect as well. Well, maybe it does. Let's see. But yeah, this is this is dope. This is this is this is heavy, man. Look at it. It's like this stuff's heavy. This thing, this thing is, this thing already weighs about 400 grams. So therefore, shipping it is, it's like minimum $12. It looks like it ships for $9, but it doesn't. I will comp that in a second. I think this one, this odd looking thing goes with this. No, it doesn't. The wheels are different. Goes with something else. But still, look at that paintwork. Like seriously. That's amazing paintwork for the age. Like the only thing that will make it look better is it was new and glossy. But when you think about vintage toys, this is this is as good as it gets when you find things in the op shop. <clears throat> just heavy. They're just heavy. These are these are the toys that I will not give to my kids. Like the stuff that the stuff that our kids play with nowadays are like this stuff. It's like you know. It makes a rattly noise, it's, it's like light. It makes this noise. As opposed to, you hear that? Big difference. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that, if you don't teach your kids to not throw their toys, and they throw it, they'll dent the walls, break the plaster, break some glass. This, this whole thing is literally just cast iron. So even things like this, like, the the most important things for these things is that the wheels still roll. The paint has gotten the paint has a bit of wear, but this stuff most of the guys who buy them they will just send them down, and then we just paint them the color of choice or just accept it as is. Um, this would probably go for about I think fifteen to twenty still, in this condition, in this kind of you know. It actually looks like he tried to change the change the color. Let me guess the story. 
I'm just I'm just stoked that the axles are straight. Like seriously, when you think about a toy like this, that's so that's just hard knuckle metal. The the easiest thing to break are the plastic in the windows, which in this case no couple of like light scratches but no dents, no cracks. And and, and when I say cracks, right, it's like the plastic that they used back in the day was was thicker but also really stiff. So Solid impact, you'll break as opposed to like it like bend. So these cars, these kind of the, the newer plastic, what you'll find is they. I feel like it's because of all the multi layering and the films that then the like the the coatings that they put on the plastic, all the scratches show because if you're scratching literally the protective layers on the plastic, and then when you when you crack it, it doesn't actually crack. It kind of does that. It's like when you bend the plastic fork and then it leaves that stretch mark on it and then you see this little, just see these pressure stretch marks which look horrible. I'd rather have a clean crack. This stuff, clean crack. And so when I pick up vintage toys, all I'm looking for is are there any clean cracks in the windows? I'll show it to you. Something like this, right? Like this one again. Look at that. Like you'll see very minimal cracking. There's, a, there's one scratch there. You know, that's it. Windows are pretty clean. And the next thing is the axles because the other weak point is the... The thinnest bit of metal are the wheels. So if someone steps on this, the body doesn't warp. With these, with these guys, the body actually does warp. So when I look at toys, I go, the body doesn't, body is intact, paintwork good, happy with that. And then if the axles are not bent, pretty much tells the story of the item, which is pick it up. Oh, so nice. For me, I'm just looking for stuff with weight. Um, weight and weight and good paint. It was stuff like this. Like this one was meant to be. I think it's meant to do something. Like this is meant to be like a light that turns or something. But one cannot expect vintage toys electronics to still work. Ah, this is the one. So <laughs> there were these like uh, made in Hong Kong real rider cars where essentially they're like it's like a it's like back when they couldn't make ferrari back when they couldn't call them ferrari so therefore they just designed them looking like a ferrari and just called them something else but yeah like even the tire threads i'm not sure if you can see it like the tire threads are still intact and they roll one two Got a couple of bone shakers in there as well. It's weird with it's weird with Hot Wheels because you can have like all these fantasy cars that no one really cares about, and then suddenly you get you get a design like that that's a bit more iconic, you know, and just somehow has a following. And then and then once you're in the you, once you start selling in the category, you'll pick out the stuff that um, that people actually religiously want, which is weird. Um, and then and that applies to every category. Like, um, and then, you know, occasionally I'll see stuff like that that I want to keep for myself. She's pretty. Ah, Ferraris. There we go. I remember seeing a bunch of Ferraris in there and I was like, ah! For a buck each. So Ferraris tend to be about 10 to 20, depending on which ones they are. And these ones, like, the condition's amazing. You guys know the kind of photos I take of cars. And look at the corners. Look at that. Literally, looks like, or well, there's a couple of chips at the front, but look at the back. That butt looks like unused lipstick. So shiny. And there's nothing, and there's nothing worse, right, than getting a car with stripes down the middle and then having a scratch that breaks the line. You go, ah, I can't take a nice photo now. But this one, look at that. So clean. I'm making the the voice that I'm making. In case you're wondering. The, so clean. So clean. So clean. That's that's from my sister. She, whenever I remember, whenever she used to buy like a new soft toy, or so, or if she wanted to justify like a cute purchase, she'd be like, "But it's so tiny. It's so cute. Isn't it cute? Isn't it cute? Isn't it cute?" So yeah, I picked it up from her. Don't even. I don't even think to do it. I just do it. So if that annoys you, I am sorry. <laughs> oh, another 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 Z three, different color. Uh, more Mario Kart. 
match these matchbox these matchbox um like kenworth pw trucks i love them because the the whole thing is obviously metal there are a couple of plastic bits like the fenders that get chipped off these antennas are really fragile like if you flick them hard enough they'll just come off kind of like um it's like breaking it's like breaking a really thin rice noodle and the reason i like this is because they mix and match so depending on what what the print is on the actual cab is it what it's called the actual truck the engine part motor part the front part they will they will the collectors tend to display them with different trailers so i always pick them up even if they're not complete just because you know something wrong if you if people like different kind of colors uh what else was it uh hoon cars do really well surprise surprise so like lancer evos do well um what else uh, I think it looks like a. I think it looks like an S two thousand in here as well. Like them, S two thousand. This one needs a bit of a clean. Oh no, just blue tech. Yeah, just blue tech. Remember that? I'm not sure if you guys remember that video where I, I talked about how I take photos on two different angles for the windows just because of scratches. How satisfying does that window look? It's, it's funny, Your, there are, there's all these things that people buy from the States, they bring to Australia, and then eventually it just goes back to the States. Um, because there are people who start liking something anew. And I think that's the beauty of eBay, the fact that somebody can start liking something anew and get started. eBay provides them access to all these things that, that they can... Um, you know, as opposed to, as opposed to, you know, if you start late, you have to just get what's current. And I think if you, if you embrace sending things overseas, I know it's scary and I know I keep harping on about doing overseas, um, overseas sales. You will see your sales increase. You may see a couple of scams here and there, but for the increase in sales that you get, it is worth it. It is so worth it. You, and if, if anything, not just for the sale itself, being able to see how a platform connects you with the world that's that's the best part like i don't the last thing you want is to be you know like like bell um tiny town same old people uh waking up to say bonjour bonjour like you know it's the same thing over and over and over again if you're going from a job to being a reseller and you're just trying to make ends meet great you've got needs but the moment you can meet your needs you have you owe it to yourself to take this business further than your perspective knows and ebay literally is a bunch of open doors if you do the moment you do international shipping you will see that your items have demand so far beyond your what you imagine was possible that the next time you decide to do any opportunity any um, any venture, you will appreciate that your demand isn't limited to what you know. And that's very powerful for anybody in business. For myself, um, I remember when I became, uh, when I was in the bank, it was whatever leads we got given, plus the customers that walked in, plus then those customers telling other people to then come and find us. But recognizing that I only had one bank to sell, therefore, my people were going to come in and compare, and if I couldn't match or beat, they would go elsewhere. But then the moment I became a mortgage broker and I had most of the banks on my panel, it was like, all right, if it's not the product that's going to limit me, it's definitely who I choose to do business with, who I put myself out there to, to get to know. I would join, I did networking events for a little bit. I would go to um, the like a weekly fresh networking, it was like a BNI kind of thing. And then also there was the word of mouth, there was referral partners, recognizing that your name can travel. Okay. Now doing eBay is like by doing international sales, I know my products can go anywhere. All I have to do is make sure that my photographs showcase my item. Um, that's that, that's something that resellers need to appreciate. eBay brings the buyers to a platform and narrows them down into a search. Once they're at that search, 
the responsibility shifts to you, the seller, to showcase your items. If you showcase your items in a way that is universally um, appreciated, you are going to increase your chances of making that sale. And when you see that this item sold in Japan, huh, this item sold in Canada, interesting. This item got sent to Indonesia, I wonder why. You know, is it because of the currency? It can't be. Indonesia's currency is crap. Stuff went to Japan. Fair enough. You know, like, you, it makes you really appreciate the factors that come together for your item to go from you to there. And then, so then, my natural progression would be YouTube, right? When I was thinking about making content, what, who is going to watch my stuff? Who is going to actually spend time with me on a live video? Who is going to engage with the posts? Um, will I be too much? Will I be too little? Will I be consistent and consistent? I don't know, right? Will I be excited? Will I be intimidated? Like all of these things. But having an understanding of reach, understanding that my inputs can travel is so powerful. And I actually give credit to eBay for that because it allowed me to see how my effort and my ideas and the way that I showcase what I can do travels. And in turns, closes deals, connections, I get paid. So, um, Try the internet. I really, uh, for those of you who don't do international, I really strongly recommend doing the international thing because it's just, it's an eye-opener. That's really what it is. It's an eye-opener in, in short. Yeah. But when people talk about, I want it to be, you know, fast profit, fast profit. Yes, of course. Ideally, if you, if you could choose, if I could choose, I want fast profit. But, if I, but that places a lot of pressure on me to find fast profit items regularly. So that's why I do the six store account thing, niche down into a category and really get to know my category, all the nuts and bolts, because, and do the international shipping thing, because I'm increasing my chances on the sale end rather than placing all that pressure on the sourcing end. It doesn't mean that the stuff I'm buying is bad, right? If something takes, if usually we want things to sell at three months, and it takes, and you're in a business, and you insist that everything must move in one month. You have to source very aggressively and have good days like this all the time. But the moment you allow, you have a store that, you know, these cars may move, um, let's say these Ferraris may move one every three months. But the moment you have seven of them listed, somebody might just come and buy them all in one month. That's the power of having a very niche down store. So, my reason for doing that is so that I give myself the better chance of that combined sale because somebody who wants similar items will buy them all in one go. And I see that all the time. So that's why I, firstly, it doesn't, lower price items don't freak me out. I recognize that someone's going to pick it up with something else. Um, if you're, this is very much the case for the, for the niche store instead of the general store. I know that it's, it may seem easier to do the general store at the start because you can source anything. But when you go deeper, you also come to realize, wait, I can also source anything in this very narrow silo. But the benefit being, I increase my chances of selling most of that stuff because it goes together. How do you know it goes together? By understanding your buyer. All this is tied together. And every time I have one of these like long-ish videos, I realize we go from one topic into another, into another, into another, such that if we just talk about understanding your buyer in one video, on its own, it doesn't do it justice. So we arrive there eventually. Knowing your buyer, knowing how they buy, knowing why they buy the item, knowing why they, you know, they like buying the item, knowing why they are willing to pay for it now instead of later, knowing why they, um, once they buy once, they keep buying again. Some of these, are, some of these collectors will buy one item, hasn't even reached them yet, and they'll buy again. And you're like, wait, so you haven't, so you haven't really experienced my service. You haven't seen how I pack. You've All you've got to work with is, I've discovered you. I like your range. That's the assumption. You could have bought it all the first time, but now you're buying it. Is it because you just got paid? But if I don't go with that assumption, what I'm left with is, you've discovered me, you buy once, all right, I'm going to buy more, buy more. I haven't improved myself yet. You know what I mean? It's just, there's the range and 
you seem to buy consistently within a certain range. So that's kind of exciting, um, which means that I now will keep listing more of similar ranges at a time. Uh, I will take photos of similar ranges at a time so that when I list them all, it's that same car, multiple variations, same brand, multiple variations, um, sometimes even the same car, multiple conditions. And I find that they move because there's a collector just waiting for that search. You got to remember on eBay, it's a search game. It's not a, um, you, it's like, if you think you're curating um, the best of a particular thing, you may want to have a store that, you know, everything's purple, right? That's for you. It's not for the buyer. The buyer may discover you for the purple, but that's later on. The first thing they discover you is through a search and you compete in that search. So therefore, if people are saving searches and you are able to feed that search heavily as a single hit, you're probably going to get a lot of sales doing that. Just saying. Do I know what she's going to sell for? No idea. But as part of the learning process, if I have to comp everything before I buy it, I'll never learn. I. The best way for me to learn, that's me personally. So I think, I know some of you like to comp before you buy. I get it because there's a sense of safety and security there, but I'm more than happy to follow general parameters, buy, sell, track how long they take to sell, and then know, all right, next time I see it, if I don't have that many in stock, I'll, I'll pick it up. But if I've got a lot of it in stock and it was pretty slow moving last time or moved longer than three months, I won't pick it up unless it's like a dollar and I can afford to just sit on the dollar. Like these bikes, they don't sell very much on eBay because they're tiny. The thought of packing a small $4 Hot Wheels dirt bike in a $10 packet doesn't make sense. Yet I have sold many of these one bike plus shipping. And when you explain it to others, they go, but who's, who's going to pay for that? They have. And yet the question is, but who? I don't know. Someone does. And they keep doing it. Different people. Not the same person. You want those categories. You want, you want those kind of items where people, where people pay for items. And everyone else, despite the fact that it is a sold item, will still say, but who pays for it though? Then you know you've got that category more or less to yourself. Um, oh, I just sold this actually today. Um, like these made in Hong Kong funny cars. They can open up like that. Hello. This one's got a Bentax sold on. I wonder if I can bend it back later. The cautionary tale is when you watch stuff on, on, on YouTube, people sourcing, getting all these like really hard to find items at, at really low prices but getting really top dollar for them. Just remember that's not... That's not the norm. If it was the norm, you would not be seeing on social media. These people would just be doing it every single day. Um, that's very much a highlight reel. Do not set yourself up to have to replicate that because you'll drive yourself crazy. And you'll think that you're a pretty shit reseller. And that's a, that's a, that's a very harsh assessment. Because in reselling, it is free market for the most part. Hustle tends to get you further than not. If you're putting in effort and you are and you are being smart about how you go about getting deals, things like you know, using all the tips that you that, that are pretty common sense. You can offer to pay ahead of ahead of time. You can offer to do contactless pickup. You can offer to um, pay a bit more if you feel like that will close you the deal. You know, you can do all these things. And take on a bit of risk. You can be the first one there you can you can um ask if there's if there's more stuff at the back of a thrift store you can uh get to bring donuts to your local thrift store so that they remember to call you the next time something comes in or that's of interest to you like if you do all those things and you're slow and you're growing in your courage to try new things the numbers will start to shift in your favor and you will see that good days like this still don't happen every day because that's just not how it works. You, you, It's very much a bell curve. Most of the stuff will be in the middle where you know, you'll get a bulk lot, you might make some quick 
low margin, quick, high margin is not every day. I cannot stress that enough. So don't set yourself up to, to expect that of yourself because you'll feel, you'll, 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 feel, you'll feel like you're letting yourself down. You'll feel like you're not, you're not cut out for this, which is not true. Be kind to yourself. I think that's, that's probably the, 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 the ending message. Be kind to yourself. Um, share your good days. Forgive yourself for the bad days. And um, keep enjoying reselling. This is a good day for me. And um, I'm happy that I got to share it with you. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.